So welcome so much for the, this session, two hours, DHS2 for Education. We, this is the third time we're presenting DHS2 for Education uh, at um, this annual conference, two times digital, hopefully next time, very physical. Uh, and that uh, says something, how long we have been working on this, uh, actually. And many countries now, uh, you see the country names there, we will hear stories from most of them, not all, not Togo and Mozambique, but the other countries will tell and share experiences, hint and tips, and, and uh, pra various practices. So I'm really, so I'm trying now to switch. <laughs> okay. So DHS2, uh, this annual conference is uh, all about health, not all about health. It's about logistics, it's a lot about uh, water and sanitation and nutrition as well. But the, a very big area here is actually um, education, this session, where we, during the last year, have been reusing software feature, reusing the IT capacity in the country, in the region, and leverage the global community. And this time, we really would like to see also uh, share some experiences, not only education and health, we have heard about many days now, but also cross-sector. How can we cross-fertilize health and education, COVID surveillance, and so forth? So that is what we will do this today. Uh, and we are encouraging all of you, and I think Sophia already posted in the chat, all of you to enter into this DHS2 community or practice, the COP we call it, because this time we really want to, to keep in contact with you guys that are interested in education. We will, uh, you will be able to communicate with the presenters after, you will see all the pres uh, presentations there, and hopefully we can create some activity. And we will also announce various activities, like we are planning to have a, an, an own education in uh, DHS2 for Education uh, Academy in the Gambia, physically, and we will, uh, we will um, post those kind of news there. So check it out. Uh, so this again, agenda, two hours, bear with us. It's pretty packed, but super interesting. So we will have an opening with uh, our friend Alphaba. We, I will present, <laughs> introduce him to sec. Then we will have stories from, from the Ministry of Education in, in Uganda, in Eswatini, in Gambia, and then Sri Lanka and then the cross sector. And we will end the whole show with a panel where we will discuss future collaboration on scaling financing with ADEA and um, the GPE people, um, Global Partnership for Education, um, RTI uh, International and UNESCO. So I hope, please stay on. Uh, I think it will be super interesting. So the first, uh, to open the whole thing, which Alpha actually did two years ago as well. No, now it's three years. The first time he presented physically in Oslo, Alpha was presenting uh, the new shift, but now it's new shift to action. Uh, Alpha by head of MS uh, and ICT unit, Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education from the Gambia, close friend, being working with us on the formulating the agenda for the DSSU for education. So over to you, Alpha. Thank you, Christine, for that very good introduction. I hope you are hearing me. We can hear you well. OK, I apologize for not putting my video on because of the fear of losing my internet connection. So just to continue where you stop, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alpha Ba. Uh, head of the EMIS and ICT units under the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education. Uh, we are very happy to be part of this um, collaboration and journey for improving the data system in the Gambia and as well as the region and, and, and beyond. Uh, our presentation this time would be looking at from the, the new shift, like new EMIS shift to action. Um, and this, the, this slide is showing you a banner where we had launched the individual uh, student system at the national level, uh, as, and you could see the partners that supported it. And then the, the table shows here that our permanent secretary directors and senior management, including the Gambia Bureau of Statistics and UNESCO official, you know, who who who, who uh, witnessed this um, ceremony. Next slide. Or do I control my? Okay. Uh, the outline of my presentation will be looking at. Um, 
the, the actual education management information SIFT, why we are calling it a SIFT in the Gambia, and the launching of the SIFT, what did we do, uh, how did we uh, manage uh, from the conception, from the senior management up to the local level, what are the challenges, what are the issues we are, we are facing with, and what are the enabling environment, and how we are, how, what we have learned. Remember, the, the, I want to re re remind everyone that the SIFT is underpinned by the DHIS2 uh, platform. So the, the lesson we have learned there and our next steps. So the slide you are seeing is one of the, the picture you are seeing here is one of the um, local level sharing of the image. Um, SIP. Next slide. Now, before the image SIP in the Gambia, we had always had um, image processes that are handled at the planning directorate, even within the education sector, the education uh, ministry, we have two ministries. The people who know emis and data are, are concentrated around the planning directory. Although we had some regional officers and cluster officers, but when it comes to data and data use, you must deal with one of these people and anything has to do around those people, planning people. Now that was the challenge, uh, that was before the SIP. And, and the, the involvement of our stakeholders at the school level, we are limited to just completing the questionnaire and inserting the data they are filling in the paper questionnaire is valid. So that's where that's how involved they were. But we were we, with, with all that, we were able to publish a yearbook, a statistical yearbook every May. Uh, that was uh, the, 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 we collected in November, processed it, and by May at the year, we are able to publish it so that we are having data, aggregate data that can be used to inform the, the, the reforms during the academic year. Now, data was aggregated, but that was, uh, in, in, and the focus was only around participation and access. How many schools, how many uh, boys and girls are coming to school? How many, uh, what is the proportion of their coming? Are they coming at the right age? How many teachers do you have? What are the class size? What are the other facilities in terms of, do you have schools with electricity? Do you have school with fence and security? Or we do have school with water. So that's where the kind of data we had. When it comes to other data that make it add value in terms of exam data, that was missing. Curriculum data was missing. So this was a challenge we had. And as a result, before the MEC, before we start looking beyond this, we had been asked data, we had had a serious data gap. GPE will tell you that we were reporting nine indicators out of the 12 GP indicator. That was not even including the SDG4 indicator that was more wider. Next slide. Then we had to, we had to, because to, to respond to these challenges, we needed learning data. In every year we had national assessment data, for example, grade three, nine-year-olds, and grade five and grade eight. Exam data will show that the average score for all these grade three, nearly half of them may not able to um, uh, get good grades. So we have been, we did, our image was not able to inform that. So how do we align our current data system and image system with the current policy? The policy is saying, let's look at quality education. But the challenge of our data don't have good data around quality. Let's look at equity. Again, our data was not measured in the equity challenge. The, the inclusion challenge, particularly special needs. The, the data we had was a challenge. So we did, how about service delivery indicator? So you ask us question around this. Our image system was almost not responsive, not comprehensively responsive to it. And then so we said, what the best option would be to look at the, to shift the data from aggregate in, to individual learner. So that that way we are able to respond to the equity challenge, the inclusion and quality challenge, and including the service delivery indicators that are related to learning. So these were some of the reasons why we had to shift to individual learner. Next slide. Now, uh, if we, 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 with the SIFT now, luckily, the good news was we had been working with the UIO and, the, and HIPS West Africa and DHIS, and then we were able to pilot this, and then we were able to focus, uh, have an idea of what to do, because you cannot just wake up overnight, and a whole education system, a group of planning officers in the planning department just to shift the whole system. We needed to accompany with people who have know these things and who knows the system and who have a very good um, research behind it. And luckily we had DHIS. And then what the challenge now is testing it. We tested it and we were very happy with the test. And then we now move to this to, to, to the SIP. So you could see the photo here. The, 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 for every cluster at the school level, at the local level, our team went to explain to the uh, stakeholders, head teachers, and teachers about why we are accepting 
and explaining the question here. So the, the picture you saw there, the permanent secretary, the, the, the opening statement he made on television during the launching of the day, that video was started with the team that went around to the study field. So for every meeting we had, we had to go with a projector, we had to find a television or some form of uh, audio, audio visual so that the permanent secretary would, would, would a statement would be played on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the TV because not every community has electricity and the national TV during the launching was not made available to everyone. So this is one of the strategies we use to bring people to tell, look, this is not only me and CD and, 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 and DHIS people trying to tell you, but that you hear what the government, the, the CEO of the ministry is saying this, you heard it. So that was one of the strategies used. But then when it comes to, um, again, uh, we, had, we had been inundated with so many because we, we are aware of this, that sifting the data from school level aggregate to individual will come up with new challenges. And then including the following, uh, we had to develop a new student learner profile, a new questionnaire, a socioeconomic uh, component of the uh, questionnaire. And then we have to have an inclusive um, um, education screening tool, which means for special need children, anybody who was suspected at the time, we have to give you a special questionnaire to assess whether you have, uh, what, uh, what, what are the challenges, what are the core? Because in the past, our images were actually not only physical, physical uh, who, who is, how many children are physically uh, disabled or, or, or differently able. But now we are looking at what are the issues around you so that we can keep it. And then we had to work with our stakeholders. All our stakeholders, the relationship we are doing with them has increased. For example, the parent, we needed to inform them why are we asking for their background information, such as do they have electricity at home? Have they been to school as a parent? We need to explain to them why are we asking that? And then for our exam council, we used to only work with exam council maybe once every exam when the results are out. But now we need to make sure that from the entry of exam, when a child is entering exam, writing the exam, all the way process, we need to participate in that process. Now, when it comes to the curriculum, we've never had data on curriculum. We need to work with our curriculum department and then sit with them and find out what are the curriculum dimensions that we are, we are going to improve. And similarly, our Gambia Bureau of Statistics, we needed to get more data on the projection to help us. So these are some of the big uh, new challenges we have faced, but uh, we, are, we are happily um, addressing them uh, step by step. Next slide. <clears throat> then uh, uh, what needs to be done? But one of the challenges we face in this process is that we are doing this in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in an environment where even our education act has limitation. There was, if you look at the Education Act that says that school should give data to, to the head office, to the minister, whenever he or she asks for the data. It is not elaborate. It is just a one statement saying that every year the minister should give data to, 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 to the planning unit for, for policy analysis, administrative data. We now need to ensure that there are policy environment that ensures that the data now go beyond just the, the, that kind of statement. So we're looking at how about the budget? The budget for local government has always almost been often. There's not much support. So we need to ensure that we have a very good advocacy approach with our partners so that the Minister of Finance will continue giving us more, more funding to sustain image. And even, even for the African Union, ECOWAS, there is a sub-region in Africa here. We, we had what we call image norms and standards. If you look at the norms and standards for image right now, it's almost like the Education Act. They have not addressed the challenges around individual data. So these are some of the things that at local level, we need to revisit our policies and enabling environment. At, at the regional level also, particularly at the African Union and ECOWAS who are driving and helping African countries, we need to start having norms and standards, policies around EMIS that are really very addressing to the issues of individual data and, 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 learner, and learner focus. So these are some of the things that uh, we need to ensure that most stakeholders engagement need to be done. Next slide. Now, the, what, what, what have we learned? What, what is one of the things that is really motivating the Gambia journey on this is the fact that DHIS had, had worked for us when we had the, the, the pilot phase. And most of the EMIS domains were tested with the domains such as um, data collection, data processing, data analysis were posted. We had the, the new instrument we collected. There was this fear that um, we, are, we are going too far, but luckily the people we had on, at the school level were very responsive and they adopted it. Um, we had a new interest, a new new screening tool which also worked. We have already collected it. The most important part was the unique ID for learners because we are talking about ID for individual learner. How do you create that in the context of electricity challenge, in the context of data system challenge? How do you ensure that the, the ID you create in region six 
would not be duplicated with the ID in region five or in region one in Combo in the in the rural area in the urban area. So, but we luckily we had expert from DHIS support uh, who visited our team from West Africa, and then and then we we are able to have a solution where you can create a student register number at an offline base, and it never it will never the, the probability of it being duplicated with another number is very slim. That was a big achievement we had. Now we had image focal point. Again, this is another important part that is very important because of this lesson learned. Like I, when I started, I said that we had very few planners who were working on image. With the DHIS pilot, we had 200 focal point at this during the pilot. Now, when we go around, we went with these people. We, now, we are now beginning to have one individual focal point for image, even moving from our closer monitor and our original focal point. We are now having good people, more people on EMIS. So we are now, we, we are able to, uh, the data is able to sync from the school level to the national to the national database. Um, we are able to cater for new needs in terms of development. We have a school app for the DHIS platform. My colleague will later in, the, in, the, in this session will report on these things. And we already digitized our, our school report card. Uh, but next slide. Uh, the next step is to how do we continue building capacity at the at the at the at this for this because now that we are having all these people like uh, like I, the example I gave was 200 image focal point. We have this is assuming that we're going to have every school will have a data a data guide, not a new person coming in, but one of the teachers. It could be the head teacher, it could be his assistant, it could be a designated teacher who would be dealing with data at the school level because the school need to be empowered to ensure that the data that is generating is being used at the school before the, the, the minister or the planning director asks for it. If you have to have that, we need capacity building. And this is why we are working with uh, HIFS uh, and, and, and DHIS2 team to ensure that we are able to bring um, um, our, our image services being discussed at the tertiary and higher institution in the Gambia. So that we will not be, when, when a teacher, let's say a teacher in the, in the college might have an awareness of data handling before he graduate as a teacher or at the university, or specifically a special person going to be trained as, in, as, as a, data, a, a data guy. So that when he or she is looking for a job, he will just jump into, into the system as, as, as an apprentice. Left, uh, Alpha. <laughs> Next slide. That's, I think that's my, 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 that's the end of this slide. Thank you very much for oh. kind of attention. Fantastic. And uh, please, there are is possibilities to, to post questions in the both in the chat and in the COP, and then we can address it later. So we need to go to the next uh, presentation already. And I will call up uh, Dr. Mugeni from he's a commissioner for basic education uh, and um, in, uh, in Ministry of Education and Sport from Uganda. So welcome, Dr. Mugeni. Over. Are you there? This is Ugandan. And, good. Um, good afternoon, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Clofas Mugenyi, Commissioner of Basic Education, Minister of Education and Sports, Uganda. Uh, we are happy to share with you the DS2 in education experience in Uganda. Um, in this presentation, we are basically focused Benefits of implementing DS2 in education, three lessons learned, and then the way forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we are implementing DS2 for education in 10 administrative districts. I think we are losing your voice. Is it only me or is it others as well? No, I'm also it's losing your Uganda. Voice. Here we go. That is good work. So my, we have um, developed the central repository for learning institutions master list. And this has been very um, essential in helping us to play a key role in the national COVID-19 response data collection from 140 districts in Uganda. We have been able to collect data from 45,000 primary and primary schools and also data on enrollment, special needs facilities to be able to address the effects of COVID-19. And as I talk, we have embarked on the COVID-19 school-based surveillance in the four pilot districts, and we hope to scale this one to all schools across the country. Um, next slide, please. Um, 
the in education has been able to help us to improve data presentation, both at the national and the local level. Um, when you go to schools, you find the, the information displayed on the district not sports and at the Ministry of Education and Sports, we are using smart screens, which is a very big. Achievement. We have also education teams on data management on the best practices for data management. We have improved the use of data district level through planning and budgeting, as well as resource allocation in terms of infrastructure development and allocation of resources. As you can see the, in the photos, besides uh, this uh, PowerPoint in the, the PowerPoint presentation. Um, we, we, you can see photos showing uh, how the data is being processed, the trainings, uh, where the district education teams are being trained on uh, um, data management, and then they improve the use of data at district level through submission of reports to the various stakeholders. Next, please. Um, because uh, education uh, works in partnership with other sectors, um, we use the data to inform the implementation of various programs. For example, immunization of school children against um, We lost you there. Yeah, I'm not hearing anything. Um, Dr. Cleavus, can Niso, you hear it? and as nation reports us to uh, seek for additional resources from partners. And uh, of course, it was very, very important for us to conduct uh, school COVID-19 surveillance and reporting where the schools would be able to send that to the district. And this is aggregated and shared with the national team. And the data has also been used to inform teachers of the uh, COVID-19 vaccination so that they are able to be vaccinated to avoid infecting the learners. Um, at, um, next slide, please. At the Ministry of Education headquarters, we have trained the staff in the DHS2 for education, basically or no basic design and uh, supported the harmonization of different Ministry of Education department on their reporting needs, data analysis, and the presentations using the DHS2 analytical tools. Uh, this has also, said, the program has also helped us to facilitate communication and information sharing across the district departments and the Ministry of Education, as well as partners, uh, through sharing of the wireless internet beyond the offices of education and sports department, as well as online support, supervision, and experience. As you can see in the photos, um, this the first photo is showing the team of the Ministry of Education and Sports that participated in the training of uh, the design and the customization, then as well as um, you can see on the extreme um, right, uh, the photo of um, WhatsApp, where people are of online support supervision and, and experience sharing. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of... Uh, Uh, development. We have been the tops, laptops and the internet connection to the pilot districts. We have also provided storage facilities for proper storage of hard copies and the printers uh, so that people are able to print copies and share as well as uh, print out questionnaires for data collection. Um, the other very important We lost you there, sound-wise. That benefit has been the harmonization of pattern and the means of education user department. We have big issues of gender special needs using a tool. The extreme right, we have come up with the standard tools to avoid duplication in reporting. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the lessons that we have learned, uh, senior and uh, top management buy-in and support is very critical uh, in terms of implementing this program and scaling it up. Uh, Uganda has not yet developed an EMS policy. The development of this policy is ongoing and this policy will help uh, to enforce reporting and provide guidelines for data collection and management. But it is important that uh, we have a dedicated education data management at district level uh, for sustainable implementation. And we have realized that um, decentralization of education data management improves the data utilization at the lower levels, starting at the school and the sub-national level. Next. Uh, we have been able to integrate data collection reporting needs for both partners, the districts, and the Ministry of Education and Sports, hence minimizing duplication and wastage of resources. And as you all know that DSS2 is an open source system with a community of experts, this um, reduces implementation costs, costs and has also uh, promoted sustainability. And a couple of senior officers, such as the district statistician, the health management information, the focal person, and the DSS2 education champions are, are being utilized to be the capacity for education teams and scaling up um, DHS2, where we realize that um, the capacity of, of some officers is inadequate. We can be able to draw from this pool of experts to be able to support them. And this implies that there is a linkage between the education and the health data that is critical for implementation of health programs and the responses to emergencies, as I've already mentioned, for example, we're using this data to address the issues of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, next, what is the way forward? In terms of the way forward, we shall continue to build the capacity of the Ministry of Education team to configure the system and be able to uh, maintain the system in terms of server management and coordination with other stakeholders. Um, the routine data collection using the data collection tools will continue. And this of course will feed into the research and the documentation of DHS2 for education in terms of identifying the best practice and the strategies for adoption to further enhance uh, the quality of teaching and learning. Uh, data sharing and feedback to the subnational school and community level um, is something that is very critical and which we need to strengthen. And of course, as I said, cross sector linkages in terms of uh, all institutions. Uh, direct system integration, how DSS in education can be um, integrated with the teacher information management system, the various examination boards, as well as the e uh, health management information system. We shall continue to engage with partners for scale up, namely uh, Save the Children International, World Food Program, and UNICEF. And since we, the policy on MS is still under development, and ensure that the DHS for education are included in the ministry and the district strategic plans and, and budgeting. Ladies and gentlemen, would like to acknowledge the support and um, appreciate the Ministry of Education and the Sports, especially the basic education department, Save the Children, ISPO Uganda, University of Oslo, NORAD, KICS, and the Global Partnership for Education. Without their support, we wouldn't have achieved these benefits and also learned the lessons that we have been. Able to learn and uh, planning the forward of each education in Uganda. Thank you for your kind. Thank you so much. This has been a very, very interesting story from, from uh, the EMIS work in Uganda, the DMIS it's called there, and also showing already uh, glamorous examples of, uh, of uh, cross-sector collaboration. And then the next uh, presentation is from Esvatini. I, do we have anyone from Esvatini online? Over? 
I think I can only see Victor here. Uh, Victor, do you have anyone else from the Cetini? Yes, we are all here. The team, the team is here. Okay, and Nelly so is going to present on behalf of Eswatini. Oh, be welcome. So you have 10 minutes, so please. I, I, I think we are appearing as Minister of Education. Ah, Minister, okay. Then I will grant co-host just a moment. There we go. Uh, you can now unmute yourself. So please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. We can oh, hear okay. you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, this is Nelson Wendamini from the Kingdom of Eswatini. I'll be doing the presentation, not Mr. Nkambole, because he's away for now. So for us, um, can we move to the presentation outline for the Eswatini? We have the rationale for Eswatini, why we're, we're transitioning from the current uh, system into DHIS2, the current cycle of Eswatini, where we are, what we are doing right now, and looking at the gaps and the opportunities that versus the opportunities that we're going to get from the, from the system. And then we're going to talk about the progress that made so far. Next. Next slide. Okay. For us, um, as, as I'm speaking right now, we have a report for 20, 18 as a country for the education sector, which is a, a bit uh, old and uh, not updated. So due to the timeliness challenges as a country, the ministry saw so it fit with the support of the UNICEF to do a needs assessment of the unit to see where we are falling behind and what can be done. And several recommendations were made that we either move to a blended system that is paper-based and web-based, or we just completely move to a web-based system, or we improve on the current system. And uh, another reason why we're trans transitioning is because uh, with the current system, uh, due to lack of um, training for our staff in development systems, we couldn't add indicators from uh, international agendas or the local agendas or the regional agendas. So, so that was part of the reason why we needed to develop a new system to include that. Also, we did a, a study tour to learn from neighboring countries on what we can do. After a long process of consultations, the ministry then decided to, uh, um, with the support of UNICEF to engage the University of Oslo through the Ugandan team to develop the system for us. Next slide. <clears throat> so this slide is just current, uh, it's, set, it's telling us about what is currently happening right now in our unit. So the system is still paper-based, uh, meaning that we as a country are still Pro, uh, printing out hard questionnaires and then they are distributing them to the regions. We have four regions in the country. We distribute that, the questionnaires to the regions. Then the head teachers have to travel from their schools to their regional offices to collect those forms, fill them in. After filling them in, they have to return them to the headquarters or to the regional offices, whereby the MS officers have to collect that information, punch it. Uh, that is when we process, we punch in the data. While we're punching in the data, there are always gaps when we are dealing with data. So we have to make follow-ups through phone calls or going to the schools. And then we do follow-ups to the schools that haven't even submitted those questionnaires, which you could imagine takes time. After that, when all is done, then we, start making the tables, the basic tables that are preset in the system and then doing the trends. And then we write the report and disseminate that information, which takes about eight months if we are first and if schools are cooperating with us. Next slide. So what are we currently collecting from the schools? We're collecting the school data. Uh, by the demographic uh, information that is in the question is, 
but also collecting student uh, data. And that one is not pink. It, there is no personal identification number for the for the learners that were collecting the data. So we only use serial numbers, which they change every year. That's why we collect the data. We pipe, collect the data and punch in the same information year in year out. Then we have uh, staff data again, which is according to the serial numbers of the teachers and which is not uniform such that you can know that series number one was teacher so and so you have to repunch that information again year in and year out we collect school infrastructure and facilities data uh, what is available on the school teaching and learning material and finance expenditure data and also we get the population information from the central statistical office to make our uh, our um, indicators. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> having said everything that is happening currently and looking at what the DHIS2 system is promising to, to have for us, um, we're looking at that if as we know that there the are standards when you collect information and report on information. So we have to abide that by the standards. And when we're looking at what is currently happening right now, using the relevance, like I said, that there are agendas that are being approved that have to be implemented. There are programs that have to be implemented. That means we have to monitor them and also report on them. But it's difficult doing that due to the preset standard of the system and the lack of um, training for our staff to add those new indicators, new data elements. So with the new system, we're hoping that it will be easy to capture if there's a one-off survey, to capture that survey, to monitor any new program that is being implemented in the country and to redefine and reset values for the for the indicators that need to be reported on, and also as uh, the online online training for the for the DHIS is also of great help. Because you can follow that and see where you need to make changes in the system, and then for the accuracy, when you look at the fact that you need to report on something that is relevant at that given time, the system will help in that um, regard with the new definitions and new methodologies of, of reporting on that indicator. Timeliness, which is our huge problem and the reason behind, mostly behind the reason for updating or upgrading our system is because like I said, 2018 data, even planners can't even reference that anymore. Yet with this new system, it's pro it's promising that it's a it will be time real time reporting tool. Next slide, please. And then the accessibility with the current system. Only two minutes left. I'm so sorry. Okay, thank you. With the current system, let me write. With the current system with the accessibility only one IT person can get into the system and, and do the tablets ta ta uh, tables that is needed by the users yet with the new system it's promising that with the dashboard you can just put you know that these are these are the indicators that are mostly used and you can just simply put it there then uh, and the uh, information can be easily interpreted in the dashboard which is friendly uh, next slide, please. I'm rushing through. So, what have we done so far with the team, with the Ugandan team? They have developed a school based system that will be entered at the school level. They have developed a tracking tool for teachers and learners. They have developed um, a questionnaires which rotate around the assessment tool for inspectors, school inspect inspectors, MNN. M&E tool for the HIV AIDS indicators in the country, annual education census, they've done that. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, they have trained us on the system 
And the team has also been trained on the fundam fundamental of DHIS2 online. They've trained on that. And uh, what is pending currently is the piloting of the, of the system into the schools whereby we have chosen Run Region to be piloted, which is Manzini and he had small schools and, uh, and the number of learners are high. Next slides. The next about source, okay, yeah, okay, for this one, the, what we're taking away, the highlight of the benefit for the system is that we're, we're, we've been able to get a buy-in from the inspectors and the schools to use the system as this will just prompt a feedback to government and to the policymakers that school so and so needs this, and that there will be a great impact to the delivering of education. And then through the assessment tool for inspectors, which has been developed, we will use that to validate and audit our data that the, the head teachers are filling in. Uh, the presentation of maps and that and charts and graphs that is also awesome as it will make it easier, it's statistically friendlier to users who are not so very much into that. Yeah, and then the, the tracking of learners using the personal identification number, it's another highlight that we think as a country will benefit very much. So the next few slides, they show what as we are new into the into the community world, which, which just shows the excitement we have into that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is super interesting. I'm so sorry that we are a little bit short on time, but we really wanted to hear all the all the country stories. And I really encourage everyone. You will you will be able to to look at the slides at the COP, the community of practice. You will get them. And then we can also be in dialogue with the people that presented. Okay, so then I will call up on uh, uh, CD. I guess it's CD first that will start to to talk a little bit of the data use in the Gambia on this EMI shift. Yes. Um. Thank you very Diallo. much. Hello, everyone. My name is CD Ahmed Diallo. I work with the EMI unit of the Ministry of Research and Secondary Education in the Gambia. I am also a PhD candidate at UIO studying the plan shift of data system from aggregate to individual level as Alpha has touched on earlier in this session. I will be co-presenting with my partner, Jerry Azewawa from Cape to Western Central Africa. We will be discussing the following points as you see in the overview, how, how the HIS2 has helped elevate the standing of MS data, how it supported the registration of students in public schools nationwide and feeling a data need, how it increased the accessibility and the reach of daily attendance system and the school report card. We will then talk about some challenges we encountered along the way and other data use approaches planned in the coming months. Next. Since from inception of the um, DHIS OMS project in the Gambia, HIPS UIO through HIPS Western Central Africa helped improve a lot of programs in which our ministry as a body has realized a lot of benefits from beginning from the customization of the soon to be defunct aggregates emis census forms, HIPS Western Central Africa capacitated the core emis team on the different features and the capabilities of the DHISO platform. The outcome of this customization session became the container in which our legacy emis data is housed. This is important for two reasons. One, it created a sort of hybrid system as we transition from aggregate to individual level data system, thereby providing continuity, which is super important. Throughout the history of systems development in EMIS, this is the first time legacy data have been incorporated as part of the new system. If you look at our current EMIS system, it has data until around 2010 when it was redesigned. But if you ask around, someone will tell you that they have 1997 EMIS data lying around in their computers, which only they can access. Two, it puts EMIS data under a brighter spotlight, therefore multiplying its visibility. EMIS provides DHIS2 provides a dynamic configurable stage which increases the accessibility of MS data. MS data before this is only published as a static PDF document filled with statistical tables, which admittedly is difficult to navigate for those outside the statisticians and the planner groups. Now there's a possibility to simplify the message, customize it, and contextualize it to, feel, um, to fit the needs of user, the different user groups. 
The only thing that is left to do is to train the user groups on leveraging this new found accessibility and place their data demands and place their data demands in their own hands to satisfy. And we must, and we have a plan to the respect to um, the KICS uh, project. Next slide, please. Also, as Alpha has touched on earlier, the shift entails the transfer of four MS functions from the ministry to the school. The most important activity slash function in the school, if I dare add you know, by far, is the admission and registration of students at the beginning of the school year. And therefore, no better place to start you know, with our transition to individual level data system. The DHISO project in the Gambia successfully piloted the individual student admission and registration component of the shift in 200 schools using Chromebooks. However, the national rollout is blocked by the absence of much needed infrastructure at the level of the schools, which are yet to be placed. So we leverage the existing resources from the pilot, collect and register students on the platform. This marked the launching of the individual student MS um, system, as we have seen in the pictures. And once registered, the students are assigned a unique identification number, a registration number. This registration of individual students provides the ministry with much needed data. Now it is very possible to analyze examination results beyond the usual teams and analyze by demographic par um, parameters, example, parents' education background, which will become useful as the ministry is now pushing for learning in the home as a pathway to improve the performance of students. Special needs also has the world's attention at the moment as evident in SDGs and other international agenda agendas. The ministry has in the last couple of months upgraded special needs from a unit to a department in line with the global agendas to respond to special needs issues in the education sector in the country. The MS data will now be able to provide that department with not only numbers, but personally added. Last year. Yep. CD, we lost you a little. Sorry, we don't hear you now, CD. And there are localities for targeted intervention at the moment. I think we might have lost city altogether. Let's see. No, no, no. I no, can hear a little. So okay, I'm, I'm, I'm back. I'm back. Good, good. I'm, I'm back. You're back. That's good. Yes. So let me just sort my screen out. Okay. Now the daily attendance system um, in the form of SMS started in 2009. As before, the attendance data of teachers and students in the schools was only available at the end of each term. The MS SMS. We lost your app. Uh, installed. Okay, are you are you getting it? We can hear you now and then. <laughs> okay, okay. So and the app still um the app still sends the data via SMS, but um uh takes care of the formatting itself and is also inbuilt it has inbuilt analysis that allows schools to visualize their own data the team also designed dashboard analysis tools in the form of platform which allowed us to quickly extract reports of responses uh response rates from schools and attendance data from teachers and students and send them to regional offices the ministry has supplied devices to the cluster monitor who are officers under the regions to monitor attendance now all that's left is to train them on details too and how how to access it on their own and generate reports when and where they wish. So this is an example of um, generated reporting rates um, on the left and uh, attendance rates monitoring on the right. Next screen. Yes, this is, a, this is an example. I was talking about example of reporting rates monitoring on the left and attendance rates monitoring on the right. So next slide. So the school report card is an important outcome of MS as a feedback to schools and communities. It's a tool to rank schools based on efficiency by pitching resources at the disposal of schools against performances of students in exams, both internal and external examinations. It is a good example of the potential of integrated data system as it links MS data, example, enrollment teachers and their qualification teaching and learning resources with 
examination data and demographic data like the well and poverty index of the locality of the schools. The school report card is also driving data use at the level of the schools as without it, the schools wouldn't be able to prepare their school improvement plans as the school report card determines the priority areas they need to plan for in the coming year. And consequently, without the school improvement plans, there will be no school improvement grant from the government. The school report card has wide region audience from politicians. You can read as you know, honorable minister of education to planners, regional officers, head um, teachers, parents, community leaders. The graph on the right shows the simplified school report card, which is sent to the communities. The school report card was based on Microsoft Excel, which means we have to manually bring the data from the sources mentioned above and link them, uh, which is not always easy and required many um, hours of effort. Next slide. The school report card is now digitized with the help um, from UIO master students and HIPS and Central West Africa. Now the app is available on our the HISO instance and accessible to all teachers who have already created who we have already created accounts on the platform. Whereas it was the ministry that prints and distributes the school report cards to schools, now the schools can access and print it whenever they want. In addition, the digitization allows the schools to access and print the previous scorecards and use them in meetings with the communities to compare and determine whether the schools were improving or otherwise. The ministry could only print the latest school report card because of cost related issues. Now, the digitization also reduced the time and effort invested in the development of the school report card, as the linking and many calculations will now be handled by the system. It also provides the potential to add value to school report card with new features and easily adjust some areas as per the feedback received from the testing of the digital school report card with teachers, cluster monitors, uh, and regional officers. So I would um, stop here and allow my colleague, um, Jerry, to continue on the other data use approaches we plan on impacting in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, CD. Welcome, Jerry, from his Western Central Africa. Welcome. Okay, thanks, Christine. So uh, what we're trying to do now is to actually bring data to, to the community because we already have the system, we have the data, aggregate data, and we're now actually planning to do, uh, to do angel, uh, capture individual data, but this data needs to be sent to the stakeholders. So we are actually developing dashboards for the various stakeholders that we already identified. So we are going to work on what is needed, what are the information needs that, that are relevant to them. And then we're going to bring out those dashboard outputs that they can use actually. So uh, this is one thing we are going to do. And the second thing that we actually are planning to do is mainly to bring the data to a lower level. So, what happens most of the time is that uh, we have, for example, the school report card that is actually an example of bringing the data to the lower level. And we also want to bring that data further to the lower level. To, to, we also wanted to bring it to regional officers, to cluster monitors. So we are actually developing, uh, uh, going to develop standard reports, uh, other type of reports that we can actually print out and actually send it to the, to the lower level. So we want this data to be accessible in any, by any means. Uh, we're also thinking of actually building a platform, for example, and that platform could actually be uh, um, accessed by uh, students, parents, and teachers where we could have some relevant information for them. And we're also thinking of sending this information to um, like um, permanent secretary, the ministry, because what we think is that if they could have like a, a monthly or uh, a quarterly report, sent to them via email or other means that would be very interesting as they don't possibly need to have access to dhis2 for for those information we are bringing the information to them using the common channels that they they, they actually use to work so talking about sms we're talking about, about emails etc etc so those are the things that we are actually planning to 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 do uh in the coming uh months next slide please so um, one of the challenges, the challenges that we have when trying to implement all these is, uh, first of all, we actually have uh, enrolled, I mean, uh, we have uh, deployed and actually um, uh, distributed uh, 200 Chromebooks and also 800 tablets. And uh, there we, had, we have issues with uh, device management or challenges with device management. And one of them I can talk about is actually like um, updating the, the system because when you have an Android system, you probably need to update it to the latest version. And uh, doing that, since we don't have a, a fully uh, flagged uh, MDM, 
we had to do it manually or actually tell them to come to the to the regional office to actually uh, have those updates. So some of the updates that we had along the line, because we're using Android, the Android app of, of DHS2, we needed to actually uh, make sure they were upgraded into the system. And that was a bit challenging for us. Uh, one of the things that we also had was related to infrastructure because I mean, in some places you don't have uh, electricity all the time and entering that data, it's, I mean, it requires electricity at some point. If you even have laptop or Chromebook, you need to charge that. You need to have internet. And so in some regions, we didn't have internet. So, so we are actually working in finding ways to actually uh, make sure that those data are into the system, but we all have those challenges related to infrastructure. One of them also that we have is actually uh, due to uh, what we, uh, what the features that we have in Android versus the features that we have in the web. And some of the features in the web are not, are not uh, available in, in, um, in Android or sometimes they are limited. And the thing is also, we actually are, we're using the previous version of Android uh, app and now some of the things have changed. So there's a need to actually upgrade that, but there's sometimes slight differences between two, uh, both of them. And we sometimes discover that, uh, on the field, um, those are uh, one of the things that we, we have the challenges. Now, when I talk about the school report card, when we are building it, we realized that some of the indicators that uh, we needed to build, like some indicators where it needed to be actually indicators with uh, previous periods and current periods, and that wasn't possible in the, the DHS version that we used. And there were other types of calculation that we could not do in DHS. So it was built in the the, the application itself, the school report card itself. And we are trying to make sure that it's more flexible. So we're going to add more features to the school report card so that we can have this configuration done uh, manually by users because school report card demands a lot of calculation and we need to make it much more flexible. Right now, it's actually hard coded. Now, minutes, there's also- Gary, sorry, only two minutes left. Okay, great. So uh, we also talk about uh, this thing that we, we, we realize is that when we, we, you have this, this school report card, we, when trying to implement it, we realize that it actually didn't meet all the, the information needs of the lower level. So there's a need to actually work with the lower level to see what are the information needs and what do we need to actually implement or add into the school report card. So it's really important to actually have a back and forth communication before trying to upgrade the, or update the, the school podcast because there is a plan to upgrade the, the school podcast. There's also one thing that we had was actually the language barrier because this uh, tool is actually sent at the community level. And I mean, what happens is that most of the discussion are done in local languages. So um, there was like, uh, sometimes they, they realized with this one, it, it has an English version and they really wanted to have another type of local language that we use to actually communicate the, the information to the community. So there is a need to actually find a way to make sure that this system is actually uh, uh, digested at the, lo at the local level by probably finding a way to translate the, the information or trying to find uh, a way of making sure that the local or the community understands the data and that the language is not, will not be a barrier. I think, uh, next slide, please. So I think that's all for that's all. us. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jerry. Uh, we have um, many, some questions in the chat, but we will uh, end the, the country stories by hearing from Sri Lankan context. And Pamut will share your slides. You try at least, and if not, I stop yes. share and then Pamut take over. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Pamod Damarukon from His Sri Lanka, and I'll be co-presenting with Dr. Madhura Mahalda from, uh, she's the additional secretary from Ministry of Education, Sri Lanka. And today we will discuss about uh, learnings from health and adapting to education. So a little bit of background about uh, DHS2 we use in our uh, health sector. We started off uh, in year 2012. And one unique situation in Sri Lanka's uh, DHS2 implementation was it was mainly evolving around uh, 
the master's program in biomedical informatics, uh, uh, which is at Col University of Colombo. So basically what happens is Ministry of uh, Health, uh, they provide paid leave for medical doctors to get specially trained in health informatics. And they once they complete the course, they are reverted back to the ministry. And they are the key people who are in charge of implementing systems at national and district level. So basically most of our DHS2 instances were evolved around them. They did the capacity building and they kind of uh, were, were in charge of driving the implementation forward. So we have some DHS2 instances which have evolved across many DHS2 versions, like we started off around like DHS2 2.10, something like that. And one issue that we have is like we have more than 20 DHS2 instances in Sri Lanka, which kind of like owned by many vertical programs within the Ministry of uh, Health. So we have some advanced implementations. So we use Franca aggregate. And even as you can see here, we have mobile-based implementations in health sector of uh, Sri Lanka. So as you can see here, this is how our number of implementations have grown in the health sector. So we have we see a rapid uh, increase of our implementations in 2017, 2018, and 2019. But of course, it was uh, with few challenges as well. Uh, one thing is we had this unique situation of uh, having these master's students, uh, specially trained uh, medical doctors in health informatics. So these were kind of like mostly self-driven implementations and owned by uh, the vertical programs or, or units within the Ministry of, Ministry of Health. So with that, we had some kind of fra fragmentation of DHS2 instances, and we are now facing challenges of integrating how, uh, I mean, the, the, the data of different, uh, uh, amongst different implementations that we have. And also capacity building. The thing is, like, it really depends on the force uh, of the particular key implementer, the, the health informatics doctor, uh, who's working in each of these uh, departments. So these are a few uh, key challenges that we encountered in our health sector implementations. So with that, of course, uh, uh, we focused our attention on Ministry of Education. So we are very new to EMIS uh, on DHIS2 in Sri Lanka. We started off just a couple of months back uh, in 2021. So a uh, few positives is that uh, the Ministry of Education has established paper-based information system from schools to the all the way up to the national level. Uh, they, uh, the frequency of reporting is somewhat less compared to health, uh, which has like monthly, sometimes daily reporting from field to national. And of course, there is less fragmentation in administration as well as implementations compared to what we have in uh, health, uh, health sector. And they, there have been several attempts of implementing information systems, few custom ones, as well as uh, open source ones, such as OpenMS. And they have very good ICT and education domain expertise, uh, especially in the ministry, as well as uh, at provincial level. And uh, one key thing is that they have a very good uh, uh, resources and capacity at provincial level, which can really drive implementations uh, as per our opinion. And especially the national schools, we have quite many of them. They have very good ICT infrastructure from which we can start implementations. So our approach, uh, we were concentrating mainly on few of the lessons that we learned from uh, health sector, and we tried to take it from there. So our approach was that we, we, we provided advocacy and also we, we reached the uh, higher admin, administration of Ministry of Education and highlighted the, uh, the, the importance of DHS2 and how it has been used in other countries for AMIS domain and uh, to build the core capacity within the Ministry of Education so that they can sustain their own implementations then depending on uh, outside party. Because like uh, based on previous experience, this has been identified as one major issue, the capacity within the Ministry of Education in sustaining their implementations. And of course, like the thing is, there are too many requirements, like requirements never change and we are all too ambitious. If that's the same thing that happens in health as well. But the focus was we will identify few uh, use cases, few scenarios we can implement DHIS2 and we start small and we can definitely scale it up uh, with regard to the number of uh, like the institutes or schools using the system as well as number of uh, data entry forms or the components that we are uh, deploying DHS2 to, to capture data. And then, of course, uh, uh, the other most important thing is to provide the dashboards and also if there are existing information flows to integrate them so that they, uh, we can be able to produce some meaningful uh, information to make decisions like dashboards. And um, 
the thing is like for example uh, there are definitely infrastructure issues as well but the thing is like we we were planning to get support from the provinces as well as initially have some implementations going in the national schools where we have good uh, infrastructure so that we can really test whether this is going to uh, this will work out in sri lanka or not so of course uh, what we started off uh, as of now uh, one major step uh, on capacity building is to uh, organize the in country dhis to uh, academy for education uh, so we had uh, experience in uh, organizing dhis to academies uh, in health or rather than uh, rather dhis to academies in general but this one was very specific to the health so uh, the objective was to build advocacy capacity building within the ministry of education so uh, the contents of course uh, i mean contents as uh, like the areas that we were going to cover in this academy was uh, decided uh, by collaboration of his us uh, as well as the ministry of education so this was kind of attended by the administrative staff the do education domain experts uh, as well as the core team in uh, in ministry of education and the one key difference was that uh, this was spanned across several days like we are planning to have like uh, this for like six uh, six days or more the thing is like we are not going to have it at a stretch so we will have uh, now we have already concluded two days of the academy which was uh, kind of held two weeks apart so the content is like the final objective uh, of this academy is like we will sit with the ministry of education team and we will build the capacity so that they they become confident in customizing as well as managing their own instances at the same time uh, we try to uh, make them aware about dhs to concepts uh, so that they can apply them again when they are trying to scale it up so uh, uh, we 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 cover uh, the lessons that we have learned from health sector and also some very technical things like uh, how to manage their own dhs to instance how to customize and also we will have a major focus on analyzing data so that uh, they'll be uh capable enough to uh, uh create visualizations within dhs2 and also to produce their own dashboards as and as well as uh, that and, and and also to um uh, uh make them aware on how to conduct training programs because like we are planning to uh, build a team of uh, trainers who will be conducting the training programs at provincial level as well as uh, in individual uh, schools so this is what we have done in education sector so far we have done very little as of now but uh, we are planning to do more um, we have just been operational like uh, almost 2 to 3 months so i would now like to invite dr madhura mahal from uh, the additional secretary from ministry of education to take it from there and to um, express our audience the plans the ministry of education has over to you dr madhura yes Uh, thank you, Dr. Pramod, and also thank you for the invitation for the DHIS2 team. Uh, I am giving here a very brief overview about the education sector. Uh, here, we are actually serving the education uh, uh, for the children of uh, age five plus to eighteen plus, and uh, we have around four point two million children in uh, scattered around ten thousand one hundred fifty five schools. which are actually uh, located in very you know uh, regional areas as well as well as in the cities so country country wide spread schools and uh, we have about 240000 teachers and also these are supported by a range of regional educational institutions uh, the teacher education institutions mm -hmm. national colleges of education uh, regional risk, uh, regional english support centers and ict resource centers as well the ict resource centers also have around we have around uh, more than 100 uh, ict centers scattered throughout the country and they are actually uh, somewhat uh, i will i would say well equipped uh, in order to support the schools as well and also the teacher training and uh, currently the emis of the ministry of education uh, which is fed by the data from the uh, schools as well as from the provincial de departments because we are a provincial uh, i mean we are a decentralized system with nine provincial education departments and ministries and uh, our emis has four major components at the moment we have conducting we are conducting annual school census for decades uh, which is supported by the department of census and statistics sri lanka uh, which covers uh, uh, a good amount of data and also we have a student information system a teach hrm a human resource management system and a gis database next 
Yes, the annual school census basically covers the students data by school and as well as the teachers data and the infrastructure facilities and the resources of schools. So this is uh, conducted once a year. Uh, now it is due to 1st of September uh, and they, we collect data. I mean, we dispatch the papers, uh, census, uh, which, is, which is a huge, you know, several, uh, you know, uh, forms. Uh, somewhat difficult for the schools to actually fill out within a short period of time, even though we expect them to, you know, return these data sets as soon as possible. But uh, they are actually uh, currently now we are practicing uh, for the able schools to provide online data and other schools, uh, they collect the, I mean, they uh, fill the forms and they sh share these with the zonal education officers, which are around 100 uh, under the provincial departments uh, and they feed the data to the system and we uh, are able to have the aggregated data uh, at the national level. And we have the student information system, which is an adoption of the Open MEs UNESCO. Uh, we have only adopted the core module of the Open MEs UNESCO. Actually, it has a wide range of modules, which, uh, in, which uh, you know, covers the students' exam data, assessment data, uh, even uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the health data we can incorporate into that system, but we have not been able to, you know, um, um, have a wider spectrum uh, of the open MS analysis. Uh, these uh, data for the student information system is uh, entered uh, or fed by the school classroom teachers. Uh, in the country, we have around 150,000 classrooms, little more than that. So we have to expect here uh, that each class teacher uh, would be really uh, committed to this, uh, you know, was submitting data of their children. Uh, especially once a year, we expect the whole data set uploaded. And also when the students inward and my outward migrations are happen, uh, the teachers uh, need to actually really uh, onto that and uh, uh, change the data uh, as ap appropriate. Uh, and teacher HRM uh, system, this is uh, mainly uh, the purpose of this system is to ad, uh, help the administration, teacher administration, basically. And this is a system generated, uh, a customized program uh, with like nine modules, but we have been able to adopt only one or two modules, uh, maximum three modules out of this nine. Uh, and these information are fed to the system by the zonal education officers around 1,800 users are feeding data uh, on daily basis. And we have the GIS coordinates uh, um, for many years, we have been collecting this data and now we can plot these in Google uh, Earth Maps and we can visualize the data if we, uh, in, in our needs. Two minutes left, sorry. Yes, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is the expected scenario. We need to synchronize data systems and also uh, letting the vertical and horizontal information sharing, weaving and analysis uh, and ability to gather data to serve for quick data requirements and uh, to support emergency situations like floods and landslides, et cetera, then and there happens and quick analytic responses to policy decision making and also uh, simplified and user-friendly information systems, and also mobile phone or smartphone-based data uh, you know, solutions and offline data uploadings, uh, paper-based uh, information collection to be lessened, and also uh, widely use these data uh, systems or the platforms for monitoring of education performance and uh, incorporate uh, the uh, students related other data like assessment data, school-based assessment data, exam data, and uh, welfare uh, provision uh, regarding data. And also the health insurance data is also always uh, actually already incorporated, but other data like immune systems, uh, immune, uh, immunity uh, programs, these things we need to incorporate it into school students' information system. And also, we need to, uh, we have, as Dr. Pamod said, we have quite a uh, good, um, uh, you know, state standard of technological uh, 
uh, infrastructure. So we need to make use of them maximum at maximum level. And also we expect to have a tech savvy education administrative system. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, time is off. Yeah, so you just one second. Summarize. Yeah, so we expect that the DG, DHIS2 will be helpful for us to create this, you know, to reach this expected scenario. So we are heading on to that. And also we expect that uh, this will support a monitoring of SDG4 requirements. Uh, and uh, we are working uh, very closely with the Ministry of Health uh, with this regard. So we hope that DHIS2 will uh, be supportive of us uh, in uh, improving the current situation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, our newest member of the community. Very, very interesting story from Sri Lanka. And while I'm changing the scene a little here to the next topic, which is more the cross fertilization between the se different sectors. So there's uh, several questions in the chat. Uh, Sophia, maybe you can read at least one and then I encourage people to either go to the COP or people to answer the questions in the chat, okay? 